uh, Alina Ramirez, uh, who is um, working in Polsher uh, Institute uh, in Switzerland. And um, her talk will be about deconstructing uh, strontium rubidium or uh, insights from a microscopic perspective. Very intriguing. So uh, please. Uh, thank you, Victoria, for the introduction. And thank you also, Davi and Alessio, for the invitation uh, to talk here. It's always nice to have the opportunity to share our work. Um, so today I decided to talk about strontium rutinate because it has uh, all the keywords in the title of this workshop. There were a lot of recent de developments, both in theory and experiment for this material, and it's definitely an unconventional superconductor with exotic properties. So we got it all. And what my plan for today is to take you over some recent theoretical developments um, that we pushed. Uh, to understand this material from a microscopic perspective. Um, very good. Uh, before I start, let me first uh, thank my collaborators. So I started thinking about this material in my interactions uh, with Manfred Sigrist at ETH several years ago. And this work led to further collaborations with Daniel Achterberg, Karsten Tim, and Philip Bryden on the theoretical side. More recently, I've been collaborating with a team in the Flat Iron Institute, uh, Sophie Beck, Alexander Hempel, and Manuel Zengel. And last but not least, I need to acknowledge a lot of uh, fruitful discussions with uh, my colleagues on the experimental side, including Christopher uh, Clifford Hicks, Vadim Grenenko, Srinanda Roche, and uh, Hans Henning Klaus. So over the years, uh, our ideas about transrutinate evolved in a series of works that I list here. And today I'll be mostly focusing on these two um, highlighted uh, pieces. So for the ones who do not know this material very well, let me just give you a brief introduction. So this is the crystalline structure of transrutinate. And it's uh, structurally similar to lanthanum copper oxide, which is a famous uh, cuprate superconductor. And here we just change the lanthanum by strontium, copper by ruthenium, and we have uh, strontium ruthenate. Now it's well understood both theoretically and well characterized experimentally that the main players here for the electronic structure are the 4D electrons stemming from the ruthenium ions. These ions are sitting within an octahedral environment formed by the oxygens. Therefore, the D electron manifold is split in two, an EG and a T2G. And the lowest lying uh, states are, this, are formed by essentially DXZ, DYZ, and DXY orbitals that are degenerate within this crystal field environment. Uh, now, if we put these orbitals on the ruthenium sites, the purple sites, here, we already can guess that given the layered character of this structure, we are going to get something that is rather two-dimensional. And in fact, um, experiments show us that the reconstructed Fermi surface is very cylindrical. So it looks really like a strong two-dimensional uh, system. And in this image in particular, the, there is some corrugation, but it's enhanced by a factor of 15. Um, very good. So these are the basic uh, specifications of this material in the normal state. What I'd like to take you over now are a few recent experimental developments. And let me start with uh, ultrasound attenuation. So this is a rather non-trivial uh, experiment, which tells us what um, shear modulus can couple to the superconducting order parameter. So what was striking in this experiment was to see that the shear modulus C66, uh, this curve here, uh, has a discontinuity at the superconducting transition temperature around 1.4 Kelvin here. And this indicates that the superconducting order parameter has uh, two components and that the product of the symmetries of these two components should be um, the same as the symmetry of this uh, shear modulus C66, which is B2G in this case. So this uh, is claimed to be a thermodynamic evidence that the uh, order parameter in this material is uh, multi-component or at least two-component. 
Now, a couple of not so recent experiments uh, are shown here. Uh, polar care effect and muon spin relaxation, both indicating um, the onset of time reversal symmetry breaking uh, that happens apparently at the same time as at the same temperature as the superconducting transition. Uh, these two experiments then together, the fact that we have two components and time reversal symmetry breaking from uh, two different uh, experiments leads to the suggestion that we might uh, have in hand a chiral superconductor. Now we are left uh, with the question, uh, is it uh, a chiral superconductor? Does it mean that the two components are symmetry related or are these two components just uh, an accident? Uh, there is an accidental degeneracy of two order parameters in the system. So to address that um, question, uh, there is a nice compilation of muon uh, spin resonance, resonance experience, experiments, which are done under a variety of perturbations to the system. In particular, these experiments are done on, under uniaxial strain, under hydrostatic pressure, and also under doping. What we see there is, uh, for example, in this left panel, is that under uniaxial strain, the critical temperature and the time reversal symmetry breaking temperature, they are split as a function of strain, and they seem to be degenerate in absence of strain, which supports the idea of a symmetry protected scenario, a symmetry protected two component order parameter. Uh, furthermore, if we look at experiments under hydrostatic pressure and experiments under doped um, strong serotonate, we see that for these systems, the onset of time reversal symmetry breaking seems to be exactly still at the superconducting critical temperature, which shows that if we perturb the system in a way that does not break C4 symmetry, we have these two temperatures matching each other which might tell us that the two components here are associated with the X and Y directions. But as soon as I break the symmetry by, for example, any actual strain, then I see that these two temperatures are not degenerate anymore, which uh, then suggests that uh, this uh, type of two components are uh, <clears throat> provide us a good consistent picture. Now, uh, another uh, experiment that I cannot, um, one cannot forget in this context are uh, NMR experiments, in particular the report of night shift measurements, uh, which early on in the late 90s showed a very featureless uh, temperature dependence uh, across the superconducting critical temperature. And this was taken as the strongest evidence that this system was a spin triplet superconductor. So more recently, these experiments were uh, revisited and it was shown that there were issues with heating of the sample while preparing the system for the NMR measurement. And new results in particular under strain show that there is in fact a reduction of the night shift or uh, the local spin susceptibility perceived by the nuclear spins below the superconducting transition, which we can take as evidence for a spin singlet superconductor. So if we put these uh, pieces of evidence together, then we have a multi-component time reversal symmetry breaking superconductor with two components preserved by uh, related by symmetry and also a uh, spin singlet uh, superconductor we have here as the best candidate, a Cairo D-wave uh, superconducting state. So uh, a Cairo D-wave in its most naive form would be written in a matrix form here corresponding to the spin singlet configuration of the spin and with an orbital configuration here with two components, the first one Kx, Kz and the second one Ky, Kz. Uh, <clears throat> here appearing in a complex superposition. And we can make, again, at least with even more experiments and what we believe they're, they give us evidence of, uh, for example, line nodes or two component nature and so on. And we see that this uh, chiral T wave order parameter actually checks very well all the boxes. So at least from the phenomenological side, uh, side uh, this seems to be, uh, again, a good idea. 
But if you remember, uh, I started a talk telling you that transrutinate seems to have a very uh, two-dimensional electronic structure. Uh, so the question is, how can we stabilize this kind of order parameter that has fundamentally here a KZ dependence, so a line, a horizontal line node? Uh, how can we do that if the system is a strongly two-dimensional? This might imply that we need uh, pairing in between layers, uh, which would tend to be weak uh, in a two-dimensional system. So with this question, then I would like to go over the outline of my talk. And first I would like to give you a picture or essentially a proof of concept type of calculation that would show us that it is in fact uh, possible to stabilize a Cairo D wave superconducting state in this material with a realistic Fermi surface description. Uh, but this uh, Cairo D wave is not this standard type of Cairo D wave I just showed you, but it's something that we call an orbital antisymmetric spin triplet superconducting state, which has uh, EG symmetry uh, within a point group uh, notation. Uh, so it's in the same symmetry as the order parameter I just showed you. And now the two components are not associated with these momentum functions, kx, kz, ky, kz, but they are encoded in the d orbital content of the order parameter. And I hope this will become clear uh, later in the talk. And to complement that, I'd like to update you on some more recent results we have on the effect of the strain on TC, which seems to indicate that there are some unique signatures of this orbitally antisymmetric spin triplet state, in particular concerning the evolution of the critical temperature under compressive strain along the Z direction. And towards the end, I will summarize what we have learned and uh, leave you with some open questions that we are still not able to address. Very good. So back to microscopics. Uh, what one usually does to start uh, modeling the electronic structure of the system is to put the T2G uh, electrons on a square lattice uh, following this uh, cartoon here. And in this scenario, then it's uh, standard to write the normal state Hamiltonian in terms of a six by six matrix on a basis that encodes the three uh, D orbitals and the spin uh, degree of freedom. So, <clears throat> Sigma here are poly matrices in spin space. And there are essentially three different types of terms here. The black ones correspond to intraorbital hopping. The red ones correspond to interorbital hopping, which in two dimensions is only allowed between dyz and dxz orbitals. And in blue, we have atomic spin orbit coupling. So this is a minimal two dimensional model for this material. But here I would like to comment uh, on the role of uh, spin orbit coupling, because if we believe that spin orbit coupling is relevant for this material, we can not treat this material as a two dimensional system. And uh, I like to show this image because it makes clear the fact that if I make a simple LDA type of calculation in absence of spin orbit coupling, I see that along the gamma x direction here, if I go along the z-axis, I see that the bands, or what would be the, uh, the alpha, beta, and gamma bands for this material, they cross each other uh, twice as one goes from the kz equals zero plane to the Brillouin zone edge. Now, it, once we add spin orbit coupling to this type of calculations, we see that the bands um, actually don't cross each other. So these crossings become avoided crossings. And the splitting between uh, these bands could be understood as a measure of the spin orbit coupling. But if, again, if spin orbit coupling is important, we cannot forget about the dispersion associated with the curvature of these uh, lines here along the z direction. So let's now move on towards a three dimensional uh, description of this material, because uh, this seems to be. Uh, an important parameter if we also believe that spin orbit coupling, uh, spin or that spin orbit coupling is important. So how do we evolve from this 2D model? 
Well, for that, let me uh, introduce some useful parameterization of the Hamiltonian in terms of uh, lambda matrices, which are three by three Gelman matrices <clears throat> carrying uh, the orbital information. There are three orbitals. And the sigma matrices here are two by two Pauli matrices encoding the spin degree of freedom. Now, in principle, I have all possible products of lambdas, A's, and sigma B's here, which would be accompanied by some function of momentum uh, carrying the uh, corresponding indexes. So, in principle, there is a total of 36 uh, different functions we'll, one would need to take care of. But luckily, uh, in presence of inversion and time reversal symmetry, these are reduced to a, set, a subset of only 15. Uh, but 15 is still uh, more than twice uh, the number of uh, functions we used for this two-dimensional model. So restricting the problem to two dimensions really uh, throws away more than half of the terms in the Hamiltonian. Uh, so more importantly, qualitatively different terms in the Hamiltonian that corresponds to different physical processes. So uh, one can do the homework and the bookkeeping for all the possible pairs of A and B indexes that are symmetry allowed in this case. Given the explicit form of this Gelman and Pauli matrices, we can identify what is the physical process uh, that is associated with each one of them. Therefore, we can uh, indicate here what is the for explicit form of this momentum dependent functions. So as before, we have in gray intraorbital hopping, in red interorbital hopping, and in blue atomic spin orbit coupling. But now in green, we have a whole new class of terms, which uh, we call momentum dependent spin orbit coupling. And more interestingly, some of them, the ones highlighted here with a star, they are present only in, uh, strictly speaking, in three dimensions, since they have a, a manifested uh, KZ dependence here. So within this new parameterization, we have a um, minimal microscopic model with 26 free parameters, which we feed to the best DFT results we have access to. Very good. So, so much for the normal state, what we do now about the superconducting state. So you might be familiar with this uh, notation for the order parameter in a single band scenario where we have only the spin as an internal degree of freedom. And usually we talk about the order parameter in terms of a D vector, mainly if we're in the triplet sector with a, a three component D vector dotted with a three component vector formed by the Pauli matrices. What we have now is essentially a generalization of this picture. Now I have a basis that is not two, but six dimensional. So I need a six dimensional matrix here with my lambda and sigma, again, taking care of the orbital and spin uh, degree of freedom information. And now I have a, a function of momentum here, which carry two indexes, which one would could call a quote unquote tensor. So again, we have 36 different uh, basis matrices to take care of. And if we take in account uh, fermionic antisymmetry and inversion symmetry, we can separate these in two different sectors. Uh, there is one, uh, there are 15 uh, matrices associated with even momentum or order parameters and 21 associated with odd momentum order parameters. So if for now we focus on ev the even momentum ones, which we are going to be able to associate with local pairing mechanisms in a moment, uh, we see here what are all the AB indexes in the sector. And again, by the explicit form of these matrices, we can look at if it's uh, order parameter that is symmetric or anti-symmetric in orbital space, and if it's forming a singlet or a triplet in spin space. Uh, what is important to highlight here is that if you're interested in a two component order parameter with components protected by symmetry, we are restricted to the EG sector. And in this sector, if we look at the explicit form of the gamma matrices that appear, they all correspond to interorbital pairing. They're all off diagonal. 
So the question now is how can we stabilize this type of uh, order parameter that has uh, interorbital character uh, in this EG symmetry channel? Well, for that, uh, I need to introduce a concept that is very useful and that we have baptized as the concept of superconducting fitness, which is in direct analogy to the idea of fitness in evolutionary biology, which says that the species which is the most fit is the one that survives in a given environment. And here, the parallel is to consider um, not to consider uh, the superconducting order parameters in, uh, instead of species. And in place of the environment, we consider the underlying electronic structure. And to make this statement more concrete, I have these two cartoons here, which shows that different animals would thrive or maybe not survive in different environments. And the same go for different superconductors. For example, here, a singlet or a triplet superconductor would be uh, more or less stable uh, in electronic band structures with different properties, and in this case, different symmetries. Very good. Now, uh, to be uh, a bit more quantitative, what we can do is to start with the linearized gap equation and manipulate it a little bit in a way that we are able to identify essentially two different types of terms. So the first term uh, is associated with intraband pairing. Here, the A and B indexes correspond to different bands in a two-band system in principle. And the first term then leads to the famous Copper logarithm, which guarantees the robustness of the superconducting instability. And the second term is associated with interband pairing, which is usually known to be detrimental to a superconducting state. Now, the first term is weighted by the trace of the square of a very interesting matrix, which is the essentially a slightly modified anti-commutator of the normal state Hamiltonian and the gap matrix. So we associate this uh, finite uh, FA matrix with a measure of robustness, while the second term, which is known to be detrimental, is associated with the trace square of a different matrix, which is the uh, commu uh, commutator counterpart of uh, FA, which we then associate with a measure of incompatibility. So pushing these uh, equations, these structures further within the standard type of weak coupling calculation, one would find uh, explicit form for the critical temperature, which would have the standard BCS type of exponential here with one minus one over two mod of V, which is the magnitude of the attractive interaction on a given channel times alpha. Now, alpha is not only the density of states, but the density of states times uh, the average over the Fermi surface of this measure of robustness. And now we can also identify a second exponential factor, which appears with a parameter delta here, which if finite always reduces the critical temperature. And this is associated with a measure of the Fermi surface of this uh, an average over the Fermi surface over this measure of incompatibility divided by the distance between the bands. So with this in mind, uh, let's look back at all this bookkeeping we have been doing for strontium rutinate. And on the left side, we have all the uh, superconducting order parameters that are even in momentum, therefore they can be local. And in this context, we have decoupled the standard hubbard kanamori type of interaction with Hubbard U intraorbital, U prime interorbital and Holmes coupling. So we find here now in the last column of the left table, uh, what is the interaction for the given order parameter realization uh, with index A and B. Now, again, we want to focus on the EG sector. So using these two measures I just introduced, we can start to uh, analyze what is the effect of specific terms on the normal state Hamiltonian. So for example, if I take this last order parameter here, which is antisymmetric in orbital and spin triplet, uh, we find that uh, atomic spin orbit coupling term in the normal state is going to be incompatible 
but uh, this new type of momentum dependence min orbit coupling terms are going to be compatible and favor actually superconductivity on this channel. So with this in mind, uh, we went back and looked at the fateful three-dimensional normal state, which we obtained by the best fit to uh, DFT calculations. And this one, we um, and the corresponding Fermi surface corresponds to the one in Bordeaux here, and the thickness corresponds to its projection uh, on the KZ equals to zero plane. So if we minimize the free energy, assuming uh, that Hohn's coupling is dominant over uh, U prime, we find that the order parameter that uh, minimizes the energy is in the A1G sector. But if we manipulate the parameters uh, just slightly, uh, reducing atomic spin orbit coupling and enhance, enhancing this momentum dependent type of spin orbit coupling, we fall uh, in a ground state in the EG sector as uh, we uh, exactly the result we are looking for. And for this point in blue here on the right side, we find the Fermi surface in blue on the left, which is still in quite good agreement with what is uh, calculated uh, by DFT. So the order parameter in this sector is um, something uh, unusual. So again, in the microscopic basis, it's something local that is momentum independent. And the matrices that accompany it are these 5363 matrices with the first entries here corresponding to Gelman matrices, which are here corresponding to an anti-symmetric type of pairing in orbital content. And here to highlight that the true component nature of the order parameter is now encoded in this um, orbital structure and not on the momentum dependence here, which usually comes as an overall factor. And one more thing that is uh, to be highlighted in this context is that uh, the order parameter looks uh, rather different depending on which basis you look at it. So in this microscopic basis, it's essentially an S wave spin triplet and orbital anti-symmetric order parameter. But once you rotate it to the band basis, it's a D wave and pseudo spin singlet state. And uh, once we does this rot one does this rotation to the band basis and project the gap on the alpha, beta, and gamma Fermi surfaces, as expected, we find the horizontal line node and here reminiscent uh, vertical uh, line node structures. Very good. So on the very last minutes I have, I would like to share with you some more recent results concerning the behavior of TC under strain. And this is essentially motivated by experiment, again, uh, with the aim of splitting the superconducting transition temperature TC from the time reversal symmetry breaking temperature by making these two components now inequivalent by breaking the symmetry. So what was expected theoretically was this kind of cusp structure, uh, but experiments have shown actually a rather smooth curvature here as a function of strain. And the enhancement of TC in this scenario with strain along the 100 direction can be understood as the, based on the fact that we are up, uh, getting closer to a Van Hove singularity as we apply comprehensive strain in this direction. Now, uh, experiments along other directions are also available, and in particular, compressing along the C axis leads to a reduction of TC. Now, uh, with this idea that TC tracks uh, the density of states, we can understand the splitting of uh, TC and the time reversal symmetry breaking by essentially looking at how the density of states along different planes uh, evolve. And here there is a cartoon of what we uh, observe by uh, DFT calculations, which would corroborate this uh, type of evolution that they see under, uh, for mu SR experiments under strain. And this seems to be um, rather in good agreement. But now for compressive strain along the C axis, we learn from DFT calculations that the density of states goes up, but experimentally we see that the TC goes down. 
So this simple arguments based on um, purely Fermi surface effects and dense of states do not seem uh, to capture um, this uh, behavior for a string along the z-axis. So what we have done, we have uh, massaged a little bit more this closed form equation for TC to write a TC now as a function of strain. And within uh, some approximations, we can write uh, this closed form equation, which depends only on the parameter uh, alpha that depends on this FA matrix, which is a measure of <clears throat> compatibility of the order parameter and the electronic structure. So here we have a single three parameter, which is G associated with pairing and this channel. And all the uh, dependence on strain here comes in by uh, data extracted from DFT calculations, namely the evolution of the density of states and the evolution of the fitness parameters, which come through the evolution of hopping amplitudes and spin orbit coupling terms in the Hamiltonian. So if we do this exercise with this G as the single free parameter, we find that if we fix G to match the TC uh, depend, uh, value at minus 0.5% strain, uh, for the 100 direction, we can also semi-quantitatively address uh, the evolution of TC for a strain along the 001 direction. And we find, in fact, that TC in this direction goes down, even though the density of states goes up, because we find that the fitness measure in this process goes down, and it goes down faster than the density of states goes up. So with that, I'd like to summarize saying that uh, we found uh, at least a proof, proof of principle type of calculation in which we are able to stabilize a chiral D wave superconducting state uh, for a realistic uh, band structure for a strong serotonate. And that this state seems to be in agreement with multiple experiments. And in addition, uh, it seems to be also in agreement with this recent um, developments of the behavior of the critical temperature under strain along, main, uh, along two different directions uh, in a very uh, consistent way. So of course, this is not the full story. There are open questions that uh, we are not able to address within these proposals. For example, there is no thermodynamic evidence of a second transition at the temperature, at the time reversal symmetry breaking temperature. There is, seems to be also no jump in another channel uh, of the ultrasound experiments, uh, ultrasound attenuation experiments, which is not observed. And on this regard, I should mention that there are other pro theoretical proposals based on accidental degeneracies or local breaking of time reversal symmetry, which are also um, uh, very attractive. So with that, I'd just like to highlight that uh, we have an open postdoctoral position uh, in my group. So if you know of um, any young researchers that are interested in unconventional superconductivity and strongly correlate, strong correlations, uh, please take a look at my website where you find more information. More information. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Hi Aline, this is David Merkley. I will moderate from now on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, we have time for one question. I see Andrei Chubukov. Yeah, thanks. Hi, Lynn. Nice talk. Thanks. Uh, look, a uh, simple question um, about strain dependence. As you mentioned, under strains, the system approaches one half instability or one half singularity. But yes. this one half singularity is only for XY band, right? Just and moreover, it approaches the M point at the end where spin orbit is essentially almost zero. I mean, that it's really X, Y band. So my question to you in a simple form is this. The very fact that you see strong enhancement of TC by a factor of three, when only one band approaches uh, one half singularity, uh, looks on the first glance uh, not quite consistent with multi-orbital or inter-orbital pairing. 
but probably you have an explanation for this. Uh, yes. Um, well, I don't have uh, full, uh, maybe something to show you on my slides on that. But of course, um, still the density of states is not something that it becomes irrelevant now. So the density of states is still as a multipl multiplicative factor um, that comes now accompanied by this measure of compatibility, which is um, here helping you if you have the right parameters in the normal state, such as this new type of momentum dependent spin orbit coupling that is usually not talked about. So the question is, um, how does the, these two factors play together? So I think given the fact that the density of state is always there anyway, once the mm -hmm. density of states is strongly enhanced, that would also uh, reflect overall an uh, enhanced uh, TC. And that's what we see on these calculations, at least um, in our uh, framework, uh, considering this pure interorbital type of pairing, uh, we are able to semi-quantitatively address the behavior of these uh, two uh, uh, strain directions something that other types of weak coupling calculations were not able to do so far as reported in the experiment in the most recent experimental paper that is on archive. So if you exactly by this uh, point that if you do a standard weak coupling calculation, as soon as you enhance TC, they see actually that the TC for the 001 direction goes up with compressive strain. It's very hard to get this reduction within uh, this framework that is so reliant on the density of states, because you need something to counteract uh, the fact that the density of states is enhancing, uh, is being enhanced under a strain. And what we propose here is that this framework and this type of order parameter seems to be at least qualitatively consistent. And we were happy to find actually semi-quantitative agreement. So, that's what I can tell you. I don't think one thing contradicts the other so fundamentally. Um, I don't think the interorbital pairing in this scenario is um, fundamentally contradicting uh, the behavior of TC uh, under strain along the one zero zero direction. Good. We can now move on to the next talk. Thank you very much.